Hello, I'm Deborah Malone, founder of The Internationalist and host of Internationalist Marketing TV. Today's guest is Sir Martin Sorrell, founder and executive chairman of S4 Capital. Sir Martin okay. Sorrell, what a pleasure to see you. Um, you, said that always... be, you, said that, you said that before you did the <laughs> interview or podcast. <laughs> who, who knows whether it will be a pleasure or not? <laughs> I think it's a pleasure. I think everyone loves all to right. hear your perspectives, regardless of what they might be. You know. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll try. Why, why don't we start with um, just some some recent events? Um, you were both at CES in Davos. You're a veteran to both of those events. Um, other than conversations about generative AI. Um, what were some of the top impressions that you you came away with? Um, well, you know that generative AI or AI um, was certainly amongst the top of the agenda. I think probably the the conflict between uh, slightly more optimistic economic views, because this time last year clients were worried about interest rate rising. Now. Um, they're looking for interest rates to fall. I mean, they may not fall. Some people like Jeremy Diamond say they might even increase. But um, basically, I think the underlying tone was slightly better. I mean, I did a 10-1 session where government finance ministers and the private sector were extremely optimistic, even about what I'm going to talk about in a second. And uh, the, there was a... Um, a, a well-known economist and a well-known journalist basically said, what are you smoking? And um, the so there was a split view amongst different constituents. Those people who are paid to be optimistic, like government ministers and uh, CEOs, uh, were were optimistic. When you dealt when you deal with the C, the people who report to the CEO, they're not quite so optimistic. They're 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 worried about the which are what I think was top of the agenda, which is, you know, China, US, uh, lack of relationship or uh, lack, of, lack of traction there, Russia, Ukraine, and how that's going to be resolved, um, and might it metastasize. And then finally, uh, Israel and Hamas and Gaza. Um, and it looked quite apart from other things like climate change. Climate change was on the agenda. There were a lot of sessions at Davos, for example, not so much at CES, which are woke sessions, if I put them that way. But there are sessions that at Davos and at CES, well, in the main CES is, I think, quite strong from that point of view, uh, which are really fundamental. And uh, I think those is that conflict between economic po positivity, let's say, and Th th worrying about that things could could easily go off the rails geopolitically and that the world is a pretty crazy place. Obviously, Trump's prospects prompted um, a lot of debate. And um, you know, he, he's won New Hampshire now, and it looks like he will be the candidate for the Republicans, subject to not not falling foul of the legal hurdles. He, I think he has 91 suits against him in, in one way or another. So he has a lot of he, legal uh, hurdles to to jump. But obviously that my own view on that is that American business, I, I wouldn't go as far as maybe to say that they want it to happen, but they would not have a problem because Trump, as Jamie Dimon has publicly said, uh, did some some good things um, from a North American perspective. He's probably good for the economy, low tax, low reg. Now, I read articles that say it doesn't have much wiggle room on that, but I'm not so sure that's true. And Biden, who, you know, appeared on the picket line of the UAW, I think their agreement was 25% over four years in the end, obviously is a different kettle of fish. I think beyond North America is where the problems may be. Um, you know, what is Trump going to do in relation to Ukraine? Is Putin waiting for <clears throat> Trump or the possibility of him being uh, re-elected as, as being a potential 
solution to Putin's troubles. You know, what will Trump do about Israel? He'd probably be supportive of Israel. Um, and what will he do about US-China relationships, which he'll, he'll probably be quite aggressive on that. So, um, and another thing, uh, one final thing, I think, um, apart from AI and the metaverse, which we had a session on, uh, I would say my view is that China will ratchet up the pressure on Taiwan. I don't think they will invade because the semiconductor issue is a huge issue and an existential threat to the West. Uh, but once the semiconductor issue is solved, which experts say, I think, five to ten years, um, you know, they, Xi is quite, President Xi is quite clear. If you read his New Year's speech, he's Marxist-Leninist, he's, um, he's Chairman Mao, he's not, uh, um, you know, the, a, a private market, he's not Deng Xiaoping, right? Uh, who made those famous speeches about the, the need for the, the private economy or the, uh, the more Western model. So I think it will be ratcheted up and, and I think pressure will be applied. Some people say that the domestic problems that the Chinese economy faces, which is the second largest economy in the world, 18 trillion out of 100 trillion of GDP and the US is 28. Some people say that Xi has got so many problems at home like uh, real estate sector, uh, like over-indebted SOEs, youth unemployment, that uh, he, he's going to focus on that and try and prove it. And obviously, you know, they had a big delegation at Davos. I mean, it was huge. I think they were based in Bern and came in every day. And I think that caused a little bit of um, angst amongst the Americans whose delegation was smaller. Um, so I, th I would say, and then the other thing I would say, India and the, Middle East played a big role in the context of Davos. Um, they were very prominent on the promenade. The UAE with a big, Saudi as well, you know, with a, their massive vision, you know, which we have never seen before, a, a country rebranding on the scale of the Saudis, you know, which usually it covers the World Cup or the Olympics or Formula One or all three. And in, in the Saudi case, uh, the crown prince has a, a vision that we've never seen before uh, in terms of its ambition. And you may be on a slightly smaller scale or less prominent scale is going the same way. Qatar trying to build a similar mod model. So Middle East. So I would say those are the issues that people focused on. Uh, to to a significant degree. Well, certainly to talk about issues and talk about the year of the dragon, um, that combined with what is it, 63 countries are going forward with elections this year? I think it's, I think, I, I, I think it's 17 involving 4.2 billion people on the planet. One, So it, it is the year of the elections. I mean, obviously there's a critical one in, in America, but there are India is also critical. I mean, there are lots of things happening all over the world from an election point of view. I, I think the sad thing is usually only two thirds of the electorates turn up. I think people should be fined if they don't vote. They don't have to vote one way or the other. They can, you know, they can say, I'm not going to vote for, for any candidate. But I think people, it's really important. I mean, we fought so hard to get people to vote <coughs> in various categories. <clears throat> gender, race, etc. But um, I really think it's important. But usually, what happens is a third vote one way, a third vote the other way, and a third day turn out. So, which I think is very sad, actually, very sad. No, I I couldn't agree with you more. Um, so it sounds like between apathy, between <laughs> no, um, <laughs> economic uh, um, uncertainty. Uh, chaos, uh, or at least crises, ongoing crises in the world. So, you know, what do marketers do? What do global brands do? Are they, what's your sense? What, what should well, they do? Are they holding back? What, what's going on? Well, well there, there, there's two things I think that they, they have to do. I mean, what, what, the, the clear thing is you may have a tremendously good analysis or not of what's going on from sort of a geopolitical point of view, but what are the implications? 
And I think there are two. Firstly, um, the era of globalization is either uh, lessened, stopped, reversed, you know, whichever way you want to play it. So Ted Levitt's seminal article in the Harvard Business Review, I think in April or October it was of 1983, which when I was at Sarches, we say, uh, we said, mirabile dictu, this is the, um, the, the the way that we can explain what we're doing, you know, consumers consuming everything in the same way everywhere, that, that is not dead. But if you look at the trade statistics, you know, there has been a collapse of trade between tr- China, for example, and the US. Obviously, China has increased its trade with Russia and uh, in other countries um, to replace it or try and replace it. But I think... Um, the era of uh, also of higher growth, lower inflation and lower interest rates, even negative interest rate has gone. Some people, the journalists at Davos think there'll be such massive deflation in China that interest rates will come down and might very well approach what they were before. I I don't share that view. I think we're going to be in a lower growth world. We see that in 2023 and and even more in 2024 because the projections of the GDP growth in 24 are less by and large than they were in 23. So low growth, higher inflation than you know the the, the central banks may want to see down to two percent. It may get down to two percent in some jurisdictions, but I think two three is the new two. And then uh, you know we're, we're going to have higher interest rates than we've been used to. So in that world. What do clients do? They pick their territories very carefully, and you know, just let's sort of run around the world quickly. I would say North and South America um, w- will be uh, ex- strong, and not necessarily because of Trump uh, or, or or whatever, but because that time zone is really becoming very important. Um, and countries such as Mexico and Colombia and Brazil and Argentina and Uruguay, I pick up those five, although they may have left-wing governments like Obrador or Lula or Petru, um, those governments, in dealing with the realities of power, maybe with the exception of Petru, uh, Obrador certainly and Lula, you know, they turn up in a suit and tie um, when we thought they weren't going to. So uh, don't underestimate the power of those economies. And when there are supply chain difficulties for Apple or Tesla, uh, they build plants in Mexico. So, uh, and the other thing that un- uh, South America is underestimated for, in my view, is it's exceptionally strong on technology and exceptionally strong on creative talent. Buenos Aires, in both cases, is super good. Uh, Bogota, Duque, who was the president before uh, Petru, um, w- had a program to educate 50,000 software engineers, Brazil, where we have operations in Sao Paulo and San Carlos, which is a university town, uh, super good. So I would say that block, number one. N- uh, number two, what I've mentioned already, the Middle East, uh, extremely strong, the Saudi vision we've never seen before, etc. Uh, Africa is too volatile. Um, you know, the events as a Jew, if I can say that, uh, I'm not particularly happy about South Africa. I'm relieved about the decision today by the ICJ, but, but, but you know, not, I don't see that that was a particularly wise move by the South African government and may have been done for certain, maybe even financial reasons. And I, I, I think... Um, so for Africa is more micro than macro, Middle East is macro, and then finally Asia, um, where by 2050, according to the pundits, three markets will be in the top five, so they will definitely be in the Premier League. So you'll have, you have China, probably the biggest economy, although that may, may not happen. We'll see some pundits think it won't happen. I happen to think they will be the biggest. Uh, and then second will be India. 
uh, sorry, second will be US, third will be India, fourth will be Indonesia, and fifth will be Germany. So three of the top five markets will be Asia. The the problem in with China is if you're big in China, do you really want to be bigger? Because given the Taiwan risk, which I think is relevant and real, as I explained before, uh, if you're big in China, you want to diversify your risk. If you're small in China, uh, small being defined as 18 trillion out of uh, 100 trillion. So if if 20%, 15 to 20% of your sales, like with Apple and Tesla, come from China, fine. You don't, Do you really want to get bigger? Probably not. If if you're like Unilever or Reckitt's at 7 and 9% of sales, you probably want to be bigger. So China, obviously front and center, not to be ignored. I mean, even at a growth rate of four and a half percent, which I think they're now starting to project as opposed to double digits that they've had before, uh, China is still born. But the other markets, the new, what I call New Asia, India, the big beneficiary, Modi, a, a brilliant brand ambassador, a chief brand officer for India probably will get reelected somewhat controversial in some respects but a real leader and we we lack leadership in the world i think there are no clintons there are no blairs there are no kissingers from a diplomatic point of view there's no reagan's no thatchers whatever there's no kennedys and so we're bereft of leadership and modi i think is a a beacon of that i mean not not everybody will agree with that, but I think he's been done a wondrous job on India. So, that, and then uh, Vietnam. Uh, people forget about it, but one of the fastest growth economies last last year or the year before last, like Saudi, will continue to grow. Uh, Indonesia, as I mentioned before, very important. Thailand, Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia. These markets, New Asia, will be important. Japan. That's not to say Japan, which is, has a, a revitalization ever since. Warren Buffett bought into the trading companies, you know, he suddenly, as he does masterfully, turns everybody's attention to it. Um, but Japan and Australia and New Zealand will be important. Australia are, fo are forging stronger relationships with China, interestingly, despite the Quad. Uh, so I think that's that's it. Now, I didn't mention Europe. Um, and and the, the, the challenging thing is every client I talk to sees Europe as without, almost without exception as a cost center, not a revenue center. So France, Germany, Italy, Spain, the UK, despite the fact UK is not part of the EU anymore, maybe, uh, hopefully it'll go back to being maybe under Starmer Hill. If Starmer beats uh, Sunak in the, the British election, probably be the, later this year, um, maybe we'll end up getting closer. We've already got closer than we were before. Um, and we haven't, we've made a mess of Brexit, I think, and I was a Remainer, um, and I think we've denied ourselves massive opportunities there, but others obviously di disagree. But Europe, I think, is very challenged, which brings me to the second point. So you've got geographical fragmentation. So pick your, give the anal analogy, ba economic battlefields uh, carefully. Whereas before you could do it anyway, you know, as long as the demographics were fine, free trade, reducing tariffs, um, the, the opposite of making America great again um, was was the the way to go. The other thing is, uh, and it's not just Europe, because of slow growth or slower growth, higher inflation, higher interest rates, the need to be efficient has get so that's where. AI, AGI comes in, but it's not just AI, AGI, it's blockchain, which eradicates friction in supply chain systems or in systems generally, um, cloud computing, uh, quantum computing, uh, metaverse, which I think is underestimated now, it was probably overhyped, but now when we look at sports, entertainment, music, training, medical, the medical things that you can do with the metaverse are amazing. Um, you know, operations remotely, uh, training remotely, I mean, extraordinary. And work from anywhere, work from home, it'll make it uh, easier for a more distributed economy. So, so the technologies become into their own. So those are the two things, geographical fragmentation 
and then increased efficiency. It obviously raises questions about employment. And I'm not being controversial, I don't think, but you know, I'm certainly that there are people who think that that more jobs will be created. I do not believe that to be the case. I think the, the jobs will be destroyed um, and they will be reduced. And I think, um, you know, Keynes, as always, will be proved to be right, maybe about 100 years later than he anticipated in 1933 when he said automation would mean that we have more holidays. I think we're going to have more holidays. And the work-life balance, when you see companies <coughs> instituting four-day weeks, big companies, as I noticed an article on a couple of them this week, that productivity, they get people pay, pay the same as five days, or seven days, uh, but they they um, only come in four days. I think, um, and they say productivity is being maintained. Certainly, Eric, you know, I, lo I lo love my connection with the Harvard Business School and the academic research I've seen there on work from home, work from anywhere, uh, sort of tends to say, be favorable about it and favorable about distributed workforces. And I think there's a really interesting this is very controversial, but you know, Gen Z is a me generation. It's not a we generation. And I won't go into my justification of that unless you want to, but, but I think it's much more difficult to manage a company now with Gen Zers than it was before. They have different objectives, different likes and dislikes, look for work-life balance. But the AI plus that is a neat, it's sort of, it's a jigsaw that fits together because you may see more things uh, happening uh, in relation to employment, et cetera. So, so that's uh, where I think, uh, where I think we are. Do you think companies can afford that work-life balance or do you, I mean, what does this, now there's big well, issues. They're, they're, yeah. they're, there are the hawk, there are the hawks. There's the, you know, the David Solomon's, the, Jamie Diamonds, the uh, James Gormans, you know, who say I've got to have everybody in the office five days a week. Uh, I think Bank of America sent what I think what were called in quote marks letters of education to their employees, saying you know if you you're not in five days a week, uh, you'll be penalised. Um, I'm not sure. I I'm sort of split on it. I mean, our company. On average, we're about three days a week in the office. Um, you know, we are a global company, a mini global with about 8,000 people in 32 countries in about 60 offices. Um, I, I think actually the productivity was better at the beginning of COVID. I think that was such a threat that we we pulled together. I think since since then, it's become more difficult to deal with. Um, but, you know, the hawks would say you've got to be in the office. I think my kids are, are probably more hawkish than me. I'm a little bit more relaxed. There's a big regional difference. So Asia Pacific, four or five days a week in the office is our experience. <coughs> Europe, say three days a week. Latin America, four to five. America, North America, Canada, probably the, the toughest where, you know, one or two days is not uncommon. Uh, and you know the figures uh, came out this week about commercial real estate, firstly being uh, underwater in relation to debt, and secondly being vacant uh, vacancies in some cities. You know, twenty percent, twenty percent plus. So, so it's a very different world, and and things are changing. And as I say, I'm split on it. Um, you know, I could go either way. Um, but you know, I think there has been, I think productivity is not as strong as it was, let's say in 2020, in the year of COVID or 2021, the year of recovery from, from COVID. So, so I, I, I think it's, the jury's out on it, really. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned obviously two things, the lessening of, of globalization and then whether you want to call it technology or efficiency and so on. I recall from from past speeches you've given at various industry events that you always talked about brands are looking for better, cheaper, faster. 
So mm -hmm. do you think that that's now only accelerated or is there anything else that then you might add to that dimension? Well, um, we're faster, better, we, faster you know, agility is key. Mm -hmm. uh, every CEO claims his organization is agile, agile and yeah. the, re the reality is not necessarily the case. Better means a better understanding of technology and do, which we have at, at our S4 or, and its operating company uh, with the monks. Um, we really have deep technological understanding. For example, our exclusive arrangement in outside broadcasting with NVIDIA, AWS, and Adobe, and uh, cheaper or more efficient in that slower growth world is becoming more higher interest rates as a result of, low, of higher inflation. Efficiency is becoming more important. The only, the only other thing I would add to that is more. More means uh, AI, that AI enables us to do more. So faster, better, more efficient, cheaper, whatever you would call it, and more. And I think that positioning is really important. And the reason it's important is that everybody's become short term. If you're running a listed company, I mean, last year, uh, one CMO of a major global company said to me, you know, it had a new CEO and the CEO was saying, why are we all doing this upper funnel brand stuff uh, for large amounts of money? I have to talk to institutions or analysts every quarter. You know, the, the key one is what's my top line growth? Um, like for like. And um, so I think, Everybody, and then private equity, I don't know how much private equity represents of industry, but let's say it's 15%, 20%, whatever it is at the margin. <coughs> it's gr growing its share because 30, 40% of deals, maybe even more this year, given what's happening in the markets with interest rates possibly coming down, even more this year will be private equity scooping up stuff and they, they have a, you know, almost three trillion of dry dollars of dry powder according to the experts so everything is short term and therefore um activation performance measurement are really the key issues and that's why lower funnel mid funnel work as we refer to it is becoming more and more important and you know we're well positioned from that point of view so in in theory at least we should be in a great position to continue to build as we have done not so much last year which was a tough year for us but the first four years where we were growing at you know 40 percent 20 percent in the covid year 43 26 percent so like for light revenue so so I, I think um the world has become much shorter term and it could be because of what we were talking about before uh, particularly in relation to geographical fragmentation. If you have all these political risks, um, you know, one of our clients said to me last year, which took my breath away a bit, was that the biggest issue they had was floods in their factories, that whether you blame climate change or not, floods in the factories was the biggest problem. And then, you know, the, the conventional wisdom was just in time manufacturing. It's the same thing when, with hacking. The conventional wisdom was to have a single network when people hacked you distribute the network well with supply chain is exactly the same uh, before there were these disturbances before we were in the levitt world of globalization where tariff barriers were coming down and free trade was so important as it still is um, what now becomes important as things become more fractured is diversifying your supply chain and not being dependent. You know, Tesla, I think got a 1.8 million car capacity and a million of that is China. So if the Chinese put pressure on Musk and Tesla, you know, they're up the creek without a paddle. So it's it becomes really difficult, I, I, I think. So I think everything is, it's not everything, but brand building in the classic sense, which our industry loves. And they look back to the days of Don Draper and Maya men with through rose tinted spectacles. Um, whilst they may be true that big ideas are extremely powerful, particularly when they're done from a branding perspective. Um, 
and and then I think you know digital, which is two thirds of the market. So the market media market's nine fifty trillion. Um, about six hundred and fifty. Uh, sorry, nine fifty billion. So, uh, about six hundred and fifty billion is from digital, and of that six fifty, four hundred billion comes from ad revenues come to Alphabet, to Meta, and to Amazon. And then the other three platforms are reported, Tencent, Alibaba, or Alibaba, Tencent, in that order, and ByteDance, which is TikTok. So so those are the six big, big platforms. And they are inherently much more short-term, much more tactical. And, you know, the, the sort of stuff we do for Netflix, or what I call the Netflix model, where data drives the development of content you know, on, on we might produce for a campaign for Netflix one and a half million in theory, one and a half million different creative assets, and we use fifteen to twenty thousand of them uh, on a on a, a or maybe a little bit more, fifty to seventy thousand of them uh, for a campaign with AI. By the way, and we can talk about AI in a broader context in a second with AI that can be multiples of that. So it's huge opportunities um, in, in, in to become much more tactical, data-driven in an iterative process. So you get the data, it gives you the insight, you develop the creative capabilities, you test them, you see what the reaction is. So it's totally different to the TV advertising model. Um, which is under huge pressure at the moment. I mean, linear TV last year was down about 10 or 11%. I mean, if you had sports, you were down less, like Fox and Disney. But if you didn't like Discovery, Warner, have a you're down 14%. Whereas if you were Fox or ABC or uh, Disney with um, ABC and you have ESPN, you're, you're, you're down about three, four, five percent. So and that was the bifurcation because the platforms last year grew by 10 percent on average. We haven't had the final figures, but I think it'd be 10, 11 percent. And so you had this 20 point difference between linear TVs going off by 10 and and um, digital up by 10. So you said you wanted to talk for a minute about AI. Um, I mean, we've yeah. touched on it. We've touched on it from everything from efficiencies and jobs. A any anything else about the risks rewards? <laughs> well, we have we have five areas that we think so far that uh, AI is affecting our business. Uh, the first is visualization and copyright. So, what took us uh, three weeks or months can be done literally in hours. Now, that's a two-edged sword because procurement departments will say to us. You sell time, we should sell outcomes, but you sell time. Um, you know, we want a slug of that, a slice of that. So that can be good and it can be <clears throat> bad. Second area is hyper personalization. So the, net, <clears throat> the Netflix model <clears throat> on steroids, that means more, as I said before, in faster, better, cheaper, and more. Uh, big opportunity. Third area is media planning and buying. You're not going to need 10,000, 15,000 people in a media buying network or planning network to execute, particularly digital, which is already 65%, will go to 70% of, of media by 2025. And that's huge from an algorithmic point of view. And, and the algorithms, the machines, can deal with all the variables much more effectively than the human mind that but the humans obviously can take the data and interpret it in the right way and they have more stuff to work with so portfolio allocation media investment management we used as we used to call it at wpp because it's just like portfolio deployment for investment but in the media sense that becomes more and more important there are 250,000 people about who work for the holding companies in media planning and buying and, and elsewhere, there won't be 250,000 doing that in three years' time. And the other thing is the platforms will build their enterprise capability. I mean, already Meta and Alphabet are building uh, Pmax in the case of Google, 
and Advantage Plus in the case of uh, Meta. And if you looked at the three quarter, third quarter results of Meta, I mean, alternative, uh, Advantage Plus is growing fast, as is Pmax at Google. And that's with small and medium-sized companies, but eventually, it'll, in my view, will go to enterprise. Uh, the fourth area is general efficiency. I mentioned the OBS example with Adobe and AWS and, um, and NVIDIA, where we're the exclusive integration partner. I mean, it's a good example of efficiency generally from an agency point of view and a, and a uh, um, client point of view. And you know, with that uh, operation, you know, if you wanted to broadcast uh, a football match or NFL game, you need a tr broadcasting truck. It would cost you about seven, eight, nine million. You'd amortize it over five years at about one and a half million a year. The, the cost that we can s supply exactly the same service remotely done, you can do it from anywhere uh, you choose. So lower cost hubs, the, um, the annual cost will be about 100, 200,000. So you're talking about a 90% cost reduction. So that's a good example of efficiency. <laughs> the fifth and final area where we've seen it is um, in knowledge transfer or what I call democratization of knowledge. So we have 900 people working on Google, uh, about 300 working on our second biggest client, which is NDA, but you can guess is one of the biggest tech companies. And getting those people informed subject to security issues getting those people informed. So every one of those 900 knows what the other 899 or 299 do um, is uh, good. And then, you know, I was just watching yesterday uh, AI presentation by publicists and, you know, they centered, not, it wasn't exclusively what they focused on, but they talked about their version of it, Marcel, which has been in existence for many years uh, being developed by AI so that everybody's informed. So knowledge inside an organization make it flatter, more efficient, and the, the, the silos that people insist in building, the power-based silos um, are, are more, more, more uh, are being broke, will be broken down and the organization will become, so, so the sort of thing that Satya Nadella did at Microsoft as opposed to Balma Balmer ran it was sort of competitive. Satya runs it as a one team, and McKinsey wrote an article saying, I think it's 24% and I think better in terms of value. I don't know how they came out with that number, but I think that's the number they came out with. So a unitary business becomes even more effective because of AI. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. The, I would not have thought of all those five points, but I, I see what you mean. And certainly the no silos issues is is quite yeah. extraordinary. If, if that can indeed replace the water cooler conversations and everything well, else. Well, uh, I mean, yeah. the, the big yeah. issue for the industry, for the chip industry and the AI industry this year is case studies, use cases that the chip manufacturers like NVIDIA can point to because they're going like that in terms of production at the minute with processors and everything else, you can only keep that going as long as you, you tickle up the demand. The way you tickle up the demand is by finding, you know, I mentioned five in our industry, finding uh, real life case studies like that. And I mean, at the moment, what we're seeing, and we were voted AI Agency of the Year by Adweek, it's the first time they've ever given an award of that nature. And what we are seeing at the moment is audits, uh, investigations, uh, looking at things in a in a um, in an in investigatory way, not wholesale digital transformation. So you might have the odd half a million or million or two million or three million here or there, but the really big ones, you know, the the whoppers as we call it, which is twenty million plus, uh, will have to come in time. And I think it's really important to develop those case studies. At Davos, people did talk about case studies, but rarely on the sort of scale that I'm talking about, maybe in medical research, in disease um, research, you saw those sort of payoffs, but it, it has to spread. Uh, we have to, and we have to see exactly what it can do. Um Interestingly, you mentioned, and congratulations on being the AI agency mm -hmm. of the year. Mm -hmm. um, do, so 
What I wonder then is how fundamentally then has the agency business changed? I mean, you've been in it for such a big part of your life. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you must see the way that it solves problems is, is changing all the time. Um, yes, and, and I mean, the problem that the holding companies have, all six of me, including publicists, uh, is they have legacy businesses. I mean, when I left WPP, it was about 40% digital and 60% legacy, and it hasn't changed much. Um, and, you know, they've come under pressure as a result. Publicists, I think, is executed best, as they pointed out in their presentation yesterday, you know, they have a country model. They have shared services, uh, and they have this data and digital spine, which gives them a good story. Whether, you know, I, I met one of their key people, and he said everything in our industry is ephemeral. <laughs> so we, <clears throat> we have to see whether it's fundamental or ephemeral. But I think publicists have done a very good job on, on that. And Arthur Sadoon and Maurice Levy before, you know, understood uh, the the important he or him after Maurice was what a CIO when he rescued the Blaustein Blanchet um, sacrilegious or not uh, sorry religious artifacts not sacrilegious religious artifacts from the fire um, you know he was CIO I think so he understands technology and its importance and so does Artur Our Omnicom doesn't have a strategy. I don't think John Renner has a strategic bone in his body. I've said that before, but my God, he executes very well. So he has good people running good businesses. Um, and we'll see, I think he bought Flywheel, which is his biggest acquisition. I think he's been quoted as saying he can win any pitch with Flywheel. Well, we're about to find out whether that's the case. We'll be looking at General Motors. We'll be looking at, uh, L'Oreal in the UK will be looking at Unilever's media review to see whether that's fact or fiction. Um, IPG, I think, have got some trouble. They've lost some key clients like Coke and Verizon and Microsoft. And I think it's a bit deeper there. And, and then with the deprecation of third-party cookies by Google, which will, will culminate this year, um, the value of information, even that Epsilon has, is going to be called into question because first party data becomes critical. I mean, the three messages for marketers is agility, take, uh, take back control, because after the great financial crisis, they devolved too much, you know, zero based budgeting, and they do, they, they gave the agency too much power. And in a world of data driven AI, you have to have control of your data. You have to get consumers to consent and, and, you know, jump that hurdle you know, of accepting when you, when you, you're online um, contractually. I mean, nobody ever reads those contracts. Uh, it would take them about two weeks to do so and need a lawyer. Maybe you can do it through AI now, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a change world. So three pieces of advice, agility, take back control more in housing because of first party data and then first party data itself you know getting a lot of clients will not be ready for it uh come uh, the end of the year and 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 they will they will have you know problems uh ip beyond ipg you know, dentsu is having real problems internationally huge problems my own view of what it's worth is they should go back to japan and 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 disengage from their international operations and then um you know wpp has had so this is an order of market cap. Publicists is now about 22 billion. Omnicom is about 19 or 20. IPG, I think about 13 or 14. Um, WPP is next at around $10 billion, $11 billion. Uh, having been 22 at one stage, they've gone the other way to publicists. And then WPP, I think, although they keep on doing these mergers, I think you know, simplicity is the hobgoblin of small minds. Uh, we're paid to manage complexity, not to manage simplicity. I mean, a people business is complicated and you can't get away from that. When you collapse brands, you lose revenue, you lose people, at least in the beginning. Uh, in, the, in the longer term, you might get better, but you have a lot of 
short term and medium term problems and and wpp is going through that i mean you you know you know the key thing is not merging vml with wonderman it's making sure that wonderman has the right management and the same for vml um so it's a it's a consulting paper center of the business exercise to slam these things together you know put out a pr announcement and say you know we've simplified things you've actually made them much more complicated because everybody's looking at one another and wondering who's going to emerge as top top dog and then the harass part of vivendi i think is really interesting because if bollore or the bollore family decide to disgorge have asked for vivendi uh, i think you know they did an interesting deal with uncommon which is a, a good creative agency that uh, is growing rapidly um and they obviously have ambitions so you know that's the big six in order of market cap um or value um and they're all wrestling with the issue you said which is how do you transform from linear which i said you know is having a really tough time linear tv for example to to a digital execution so then what if you had to characterize 2024 in a in in a word or phrase um hmm. you know as as I, I don't want to say a mantra for the industry but as as just a catch all at this point at january what would it yeah, be yeah well, well i think you know, you know confidence is at a higher level but you have these huge risks the world is a really messy place and everything can go pear shaped you know people glibly talk about the possibility of world war 3 um or some people do and you know they talk about you know we've had stuff in the papers in the last few weeks about days about the inability of british defense to go to war with russia so you you could have conflict between the us and china you could have conflict uh, between it goes beyond russia and ukraine you could have a metastasizing of the conflict in the middle east you could have north korea you know coming into it climate change you know i mentioned the the flooding problem i mean you you, you know if if the world carries on as it has been uh, it's going to be very very tough so i would say you know life is better than last year and risks economic risks are lower and the probabilities interest rates will come down but what can throw everything off track are these political issues and now there are people in davos who go through each of those three major ones and say they're all containable and they won't metastasize but there is a risk you know trump wins the white house it becomes more unpredictable i remember when trump was first elected we had a a meeting at the um cdf the china development forum summoned by a very senior chinese official and you know i remember larry summers was there and a number of other people and the chinese official was high up in the party before xi went to mara lago to have dinner with trump uh, president trump and she said to us you know what what how, how do you analyze trump how do you figure out and, and trump is so unpredictable um the chinese certainly at that stage didn't know which way to go that may well be the case so unpredictability i would say you know economic risk um lowered but political uh, uncertainty heightened i guess we all have to l learn to live with um managing amid chaos yeah now, right yeah yeah well and volatility i mean Paul Pullman used to talk about VUCA. I can't remember what it stood for, but it was about volatility and living in a volatile world. And and you know, when when he made that comment, it, it was easy meat. I mean, it wasn't. This is far more difficult and far more unpredictable. Um, and the flows of people across boundaries, and the the increasing distributed working, the change in generational attitudes, all these things are. Quite complex factors to figure out. 
Well, let me just ask one last question because you've just touched on it. And then I think you've given us all a lot to contemplate for uh, the year hopefully. ahead. A lot to contemplate, but you did mention Gen Z as, an, as a new me generation. And one of the things we didn't talk about in this whole conversation was that that changing consumer and, and what that means to us all. Um, and I know you said you could go on quite a while about Gen Z, but, but you, how is cons the consumer changing? How is this next generation a me generation? Um, well, I, you know, I, I, I'll be blunt. Um, give you a concrete example. When, when October the 7th, the, those tragic bestial events of October the 7th took place, you know, we, we did a matching fund uh for s4 so we have about eight thousand people and um we said you know we'll put together a, a fund of fifty thousand dollars and we'll to match contributions and only 61 people i think at the last count it may be a few more actually gave so they talk a lot about purpose and on the turkish earthquake which is justifiably di sort of different there's even less now, it could be that nobody reads my memos. That could be the, the, the reason. But, you know, I did it with the... With the and we said for the... For in the case of uh, uh, October the, the 7th, that, we, you know, charities in, in Gaza and charities uh, in Israel. So, you know, if people wanted to, they'd have to be approved, those charities, but, but we would do that. So, and, and I think in the case of the Turkish, it was even less than 61. The thing that people, they did get very excited about, uh, not that we we, said, we, we, we funded a cross-border abortion charity um, when, on Roe v. Wade, I did get, that was a lot of inbound on, on that, but it wasn't, we weren't asking people to make contributions, we made the contribution. And when I look at that, when I talk about that sort of case study, for example, there's somebody I, I sort of talk to every, all the time, mentor in a minor capacity uh, who has a gen z agency and when i was 22 uh, ex graduate ran the business whilst he was at university and you know i ran this past him and i run it past many others and people don't express surprise so when i say me versus we uh, you know that generation has lived in a world you know it's like the attitude to october the 7th um, you know, or the, the TikTok watches and TikTok gets, it used to be Meta that got blamed for everything. Now it's TikTok that gets blamed for everything. Uh, the TikTok watches, you know, think you know, d denial of Holocaust, um, you know, the, the, the Israel is uh, committing genocide, all these things. Um, it's, it's a very different environment. And, you know, if I was born in 1945, you know, I, I saw firsthand the impact of rationing on my parents, uh, the way we lived and everything. And, um, you know, it's, it's a much more complex world. I mean, on complexity, I think this, the only time I can remember, which is as dangerous as this uh, time, was 1963 in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I was at school huddling under a desk in my geography lesson because our geography teacher said this is the potentially the Elysian fields following a nuclear explosion when the Russian boats were moving towards Cuba. They turned back and pushed off and Kennedy and the Kennedy brothers handled it uh, by ignoring a cable, ignoring a telegram um, in, in part. They turned back the ship. So I think um, it's complex. It's complex. And I, I don't you know, Gen Z talks about purpose and they do get behind stuff and they do demonstrate and they do work. But just my experience in the cases I talked about were, were those. So, um, interesting, very, very interesting. But I, I, I think that we're seeing so much change that it becomes hard for, for anyone of any generation to begin to take it all in and make sense of it. It's almost as if we just have to try to find a way to continually adapt. Um, yeah. And 
and um, embrace technology, um, embrace the new as best as we can, and um, continue. <laughs> Yeah. Well, no, it's, say it's, something it's, positive. Say something positive, what, it, please. No, it, listen, <laughs> listen. The, the reality. Yeah. Well, well. Somebody, one of the journalists at um, Davos said, "You know, when am I going to have somebody on my program? It's a major business news program who, who tells the truth." I said, "Well, they're not paid to, you know, in that sense. You know, they're going to come onto your program and put the best light on things. I'm just calling it as it is. It's 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 difficult. It's not easy." And I think it's more difficult than it has been. And we were very lucky. We had 40 years, 50 years, you know, of um, continuous growth and uh, strong economy, open economy, and it's now changed. You know, one can, Ray Dalio always has the best charts and best data. And I remember he has a chart which shows that when, from the time that Reagan and Thatcher rose to power, capital as a proportion of GDP went up and labor as a proportion of GDP went down. So maybe inequality, which is one of the fears around AI, by the way, and AGI, the, the, the fear is that rich nations will get richer and poorer nations, you know, almost like the digital divide and uh, are gonna have a tougher time. So it is more complex and there's no getting away from it. And it is more difficult. The average life of a CEO, I think is about four or five years. The CMO is even less, it's probably a couple of years. So that reflects the, the complexity and difficulty and you, know, you can make mistakes. Well, let's, let's hope at least, I'm certainly hoping that we all do try to rise to the occasion and maybe the complexity will only- Yeah, um, but I'm not, because, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I, no, yeah, no, reality so, is important. And I think it's, yes, I, I'm, yeah. I think it's that, right that, that you say that. And I think it should give everyone pause to yeah. think, how can I be better? How can I think yeah. a little bit differently? How do yeah. I do what I can and rally who I can to try to make a difference to an industry that I'm devoted to as best as I can? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I you know, I think we, you, you have an obligation to call it as it is. I mean, you know, on the anti-Semitism, on the anti-Semitism thing, very few CEOs call it out. Uh, and Islamophobia too. Um, so, and they do that because, you know, they deal with constituencies that they believe can damage their businesses. So, you know, when in doubt, as they say, say, say not, which means say nothing. So, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think CEOs have to take a position. And, um, you know, particularly as they grow bigger. I mean, Apple and Microsoft have crossed with Saudi Aramco <coughs> at three trillion, makes them as big as Germany or almost as big as Germany, but certainly as rough size, the same size as UK and, and India uh, each. So, so these are big businesses with responsibility. They employ hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so, I think they have to you know, have to take positions. No, and and they they span, they they cross borders. So, in some ways, they they have even more influence than, yeah, than just a national absolutely. entity. Absolutely. And by the way, AI will make the big bigger. I mean, there will be open AI is Microsoft. Apple will be a player, NVIDIA, obviously, Adobe, Oracle, Salesforce, but the big six, the big six platforms that I mentioned, that's, that's Alphabet, Meta, Amazon, uh, Alibaba, Tencent, despite what's happening with the Chinese government and ByteDance, will be bigger. And that they will be the big winners from what we see. And there will be a place, Musk will be a player, obviously, but that's because of his SpaceX uh, and te Tesla engineering capabilities, and Tesla's really a software platform. So um, I think it's really interesting from that point of view. But you know, if the regulators are worried about the size of companies, then there's no way the regulators can regulate this. They they're going to have to work with these companies, and there will have to be self regulation, and it's really crit critically important. Well, I I think that um, you you give us a lot to talk about and, and thank you for
for being okay. honest and realistic. Um, and let's um, let's hope that the Year of the Dragon doesn't have any other uh, surprises beyond some of the ones hopefully, that you mentioned. Hopefully, well, I think you know the black swans. Remember the black swans. <laughs> right, isn't it? What is it? Black swans, gray rhinos. Is is the unknown unknown yeah, unknown? Yeah. And the white yeah. white swans. I think are the yes, known. Yes, 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 yeah. There's quite yeah quite. All right, well. Fingers crossed. All right, thank you so and much. And even, even one, one final, final thing. Yeah, Nouriel, Rubini, Nouriel Rubini at, at Davos, who's known as Dr. Death, was relatively optimistic. So I'll, I'll end on that optimistic note. All right, well, good to keep in mind then. All right, so optimism <laughs> perhaps will triumph. All right, good. Okay. Well, listen, thank you. Thank you for Thanks. taking the time. Thanks, and, um, Pleasure. and I'm going to I'm going to check. Um, and then we'll come back and see and see what's happened. Okay. All right. <laughs> let's hope okay. let's hope we're still standing to be able yeah, to do so it. <laughs> Just look at you know, make sure you have a bolt hole. <laughs> a pleasure as always. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks All right. very much. Take care. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. The Internationalist focuses on the continual reinvention of marketing by highlighting inspirational marketers around the world and their ideas as they move the industry forward. Internationalist Marketing TV shares these perspectives through interviews and personal stories. Thanks so much for watching. If you find this kind of content helpful, please click like or subscribe. Again, thanks so much.